before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it round his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, he, but he is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. The Gospel of the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we have three readings today, and all the three readings describe a meal. Each meal with a definite purpose. But nevertheless, all the three meals have the cohesion, the unity of the peoples in mind. Let's take the first meal, the Passover meal. It has many rubrics attached to it. It has to be eaten hastily in a standing position to express a state of readiness, which is also implied by the girdle round the waist, sandals on one's feet and staff in one's hand. It was the attire of a people in a hurry. And they ate their meal in haste. There are also definite injunctions given how this meal must be prepared. The animal taken, either sheep or goat, has to be without blemish. And it has to be eaten, it being roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. The unleavened bread symbolizes the fact of the insufficiency of the time for the dough to rise. And the bitter herbs signify the bitterness of the Egyptian slavery which they have left behind. Now, we offer to God that which is best, for the best will be returned. All this symbolism comes together in the death of Jesus Christ, which is really a story of substitution. Christ dies for us in our place. This explains the symbolic power of blood 
the Bible agrees with other ancient cultures that the life of every creature is in its blood. There is the powerful symbolism that in the end, death can only be defeated by death. The blood of an animal had to be applied to the two doorposts and the lintel at the top. Now, placing the blood on the doorpost made it unmistakable that the lamb did not die by accident, nor was it killed merely to be eaten. It was eaten roasted so that no blood would remain in the flesh eaten. For blood was a sign of life. It was more than just a marker for protection. It provided life in the real sense of the term. For those who lived in marked houses believed that they would be saved. And to be saved is more than just being protected. Above all, the meal was eaten as a family. For within the family, faith is developed and it is community communicated in faith traditions over a period of time. The Passover meal shared as a family also communicated the intimacy of God with one another. The meal lends a certain enduring character to the sharing of values. The final declaration of God's victory over death is made in the context of a meal here as well as in the other two readings. The purpose, dear friends, of this Passover meal expresses the urgency of the exodus that is about to begin. In later years, Israel connected the Passover with the freedom from Egypt. And in this way, the purpose of the Passover meal was never forgotten. Now we come to the purpose of the meal in the second reading at Corinth. Paul tells us about the Lord's Supper in its own context and its purpose. Let us understand the meal in the Corinthian context. In the Pauline church, as you know, the Eucharist was always a two-part meal. There was first an ordinary meal where all the church, the whole church gathered together. They ate their meal together, an ordinary meal, and we would have a dinner, a supper together. And the common people who did not have access to meat because meat was very expensive, the rich patrons who organized that meal would provide meat for the ordinary people. But Paul finds fault in that meal. He says he highlights a particular habit of the rich. They ate by themselves at their own tables. It was a meal of a different quality for themselves. But this, that made a distinction between the haves and the have not. And so Paul says, it is not the Lord's Supper that you are eating, but you are eating your own private suppers. And in doing this, you humiliate those who have nothing. You have despised the church of God. And yet, you come for the second part of the meal, which is the Eucharist proper. And Paul here recalls the words of institution, which you heard read in the second reading. As often as you do this, you eat the meal. As often as you eat this meal, it is you remember the Lord. Now the question is, how can you come to the second part of the meal when you have humiliated the have-nots in the first meal. How can you pretend that everything is all right, we are all happy Christians, all united in the Lord, when there is no such unity? The unity must flow from the first part of the meal to the second Eucharist proper. Paul now explains, in the second, in the Eucharist, we remember the Lord, 
We remember his death. We remember him giving of himself completely. How can we participate in this Eucharist if we have humiliated the Lord's body in the first? Paul wants the rich patrons of Corinth to know that there is such a thing as eating and drinking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Humiliating the have-nots is precisely what Paul means by eating in an unworthy manner in the Corinthian context. But of course the context has now broadened to include other instances where we may eat of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Paul is warning them of dire consequences if they bring in distinctions at the Eucharist. It would mean that they have failed to understand its true nature. Each one of us, dear friends, is called to examine himself or herself before we eat and drink of the Lord's Supper. The purpose of the Eucharist is to emphasize unity and cohesion of the community. That is why Jesus died, to bring us together to God. Now, when we come to the gospel, the washing of the feet at the Last Supper, you know, that John's Gospel does not have the institution narrative. Take this as my body. Take this as my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. These words of institutions are not found at the Last Supper. Instead, in its place, we have the washing of the feet. There is a change. And what is the purpose of this change? And that's where we come to the injunction of Jesus in the fourth gospel, in the gospel of John. If I then, your Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. John is more interested in telling us what the Eucharist must finally achieve. It's not just enough to say, this is my body, this is my blood, do this in remembrance of me, and then I leave the church and do what I like. He says, the pastoral dimension of eating and drinking, of Lord's, eating Lord's body and drinking his blood must have its effects. We must carry on doing what we see the Lord doing. Remember in John that these are Jesus' last words at the Last Supper. And the last words of the one dying are particularly significant. We cling on dearly to every precious word and gesture. Jesus gives us a clear invitation. If I have given you an example that you, sh that you also should do just as I have done to you. Here we focus on the effect of the Eucharist, the effect that it must have on us. Love one another as I have loved you. Our communion with Christ must lead to communion with one another. That is what the Eucharist must produce in the Christian community. Now, what does foot washing really mean? What does Jesus mean? Wash one another's feet. Foot washing was not a tidy endeavor. It was not a tidy endeavor. People who walked barefoot or in, even in sandals, can have very sweaty and smelly feet. Foot washing was needed after a long journey. But in Peter's mind, and in the wisdom of the day, it was done by a slave or a servant. And therefore, when Jesus came to Simon Peter to wash his feet, Peter protested. He protested very simply, Peter could not understand how Jesus could wash his feet because physical cleansing of the feet must be done by a servant or by a slave. He could not allow Jesus to do it. Peter misunderstood the meaning of the washing of the feet done by Jesus. Jesus was not washing his feet as a sign of physical cleansing. For if Jesus meant 
it as a physical cleansing, he would have done it when Peter entered the house. But rather, we are told that Jesus is already seated for the supper. He rose from supper and began to wash the feet of his disciples. Therefore, the meaning of the foot washing is not physical cleansing, but something else. It was important, it was so important that Jesus insisted, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Even now, Peter is unable to fathom the meaning of Jesus' words, and he continues in the thought that he had earlier. He says, okay then, not my feet only, also my hands and my head. Jesus looks at him and says, that is not necessary, Peter. Why? This foot washing that I'm about to do concerns the community of disciples which Jesus loved as his own. It, this is not a sign of mere physical cleansing. For you are all clean, he says. It is a sign of inclusion in the community. To prepare for the washing of the disciples' feet, Jesus laid aside his garment. Jesus uses the same word for Jesus laying down his life and the laying aside his garments. Jesus gave his life in order to secure the inclusion of everyone in the community. When I am lifted up, he says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. Jesus says, I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. But does he ex do, but he does not expect us to copy the sign literally, but to do what it signifies. We are called to build communities of love. This is what all the three readings of today tell us. The church must be seen as a community that embraces all peoples. To lay aside our garments in a gesture of service towards others is not degrading. Instead, the gesture recognizes our willingness to reach out to people in need within our communities. The gesture of washing the feet includes the many ways in which love may be shown to others in the community. Community understood in its varied forms, the family, the neighborhood, the larger society. For some people, it literally involves foot washing. There is, for example, the healing ministry. Here, doctors, nurses, caregivers, tender Service to the aged, to the sick in hospitals and homes of the elderly. During catastrophes and disasters, you find people reaching out to the unfortunate ones in different ways, binding, healing, and comforting them. For example, just remember what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. There's also the Justice and Peace Ministry. Here, it tries to ensure that no one in the community is denied justice. There's also then the teaching ministry. By it, the community wants all the members, especially the younger ones, to prepare for their future adequately and meaningfully. Whatever be the nature of the ministry, it is meant to make people realize that they are not alone, but that they are part of a community of love. None, no one must feel that they are excluded for any reason. All belong to the circle of God's love. As we celebrate the commandment of love today, my dear brothers and sisters, may we take the example of Jesus to heart so that by copying this example we may really represent the Eucharist in action so that all will experience its power to make us one. Amen.